Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Oh, Nikki Kinzer. Uh, we're, we're moved out of our technology. Are you relieved? We're not talking about tech anymore? Uh, no, I'm not relieved. Oh, I learned well, a lot. Good. I learned a good. lot in the last three episodes that we've been talking about tech. So no, they were great. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. I'm so glad. We're uh, And in fact, that is a, it's kind of a lie. I say that because we're talking, uh, we're moving into money for the next couple of episodes and we'll be talking about budgeting and impulsive spending today mm-hmm. uh, with a fantastic guest, uh, certified financial planner, Dave DeWitt. And then uh, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, using some tech. We've got the founder of YNAB on the show next week. So we've got some... Uh, good, I think, ideas for handling impulsive spending and tracking your cash over the holiday season. Uh, some, some of it might be hard to hear. It, I'm just it, saying. It, uh, yes, I agree. There was a little bit of stomach churning having this conversation yeah. with David. Yes. So very excited about it. Uh, but before we dig in, uh, head over to TakeControlADHD.com to get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to our mailing list, and we'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD. And if you really want to connect with us in real time, head over to the ADHD Discord community. It is super easy to jump into the general community chat channel. Just visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord and you will be whisked over to the general invitation and login. If you're looking for a little bit more, particularly if this show has ever touched you or helped you understand your relationship with ADHD in a new way, we invite you to support the show directly through Patreon. Patreon is listener-supported podcasting. With a few of your dollars every month, you help guarantee that we can continue to grow this show, add new features, and invest more heavily in our community. Visit patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast and Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. Nikki, we have news. We do. We have an advertisement. Hallelujah. Yes. Something big is happening. Uh, GPS, my membership program around planning and scheduling and task management. Uh, GPS stands for guided planning sessions. Uh, enrollment opens on December 7th and it closes on January 2nd. Uh, so that's important to know because I don't offer this uh It's not an ongoing open enrollment. I do it only a couple of times a year. And uh, GPS is a wonderful uh, membership program. If you're looking for some guidance on how to manage your task managers, how to get things done, how to do time blocking, calendars, all of that stuff. We do a lot, a lot. Well, that is what we do. That is what we do. It's all about planning. And uh, we have great benefits with the GPS membership. So I uh, definitely want you to go visit uh, TakeControlADHD.com, click GPS, and you're going to learn more about how it's set up. All of the wonderful benefits, just to give you an idea, GPS members have their own membership website. Uh, We have our own happy hour. We have an online community on how we can talk to each other in between sessions. But one of the things that I think really makes GPS different than other coaching groups and programs is that there's two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays, that we come together and we do the work. We're doing the planning. We're not talking about it. I'm not teaching you anything. You're doing it. And that's what makes it really special is you're doing it with me. You're doing it with other people and um, you're having that extra support. So if you are interested in GPS, please check it out. Uh, Again, it opens on December 7th. It closes on January 2nd. If you happen to be listening to this announcement after those dates, that's okay. Put your name on our waiting list because I have a waiting list on there on the website. And the the people that are on the waiting list, they get notified first when GPS opens. So if you're on the waiting list now, you're going to be getting an email here pretty soon. uh, Me inviting you to the GPS membership. So it's important. Put yourself on there if you want to uh, be a part of it next time. There you go. All right. All right. I like that news, Nikki. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we get David? Yeah. David? (laughs) 
David DeWitt is a certified financial planner and podcaster behind ADHD Money Talk. He helps adults with ADHD take back control of their money. After his own ADHD awakening, he set out to build a financial planning model that works for ADHD brains. Now he's on a mission to help as many ADHDers as he can. He's with us today to help us through the high holy spending season that is Christmas without breaking the bank. David, welcome to the ADHD podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pumped to be on this. I've listened to you guys a few times in the past, and it's a great, entertaining show. So thank you. Happy to be here. Well, thank you. So, so you know, now you know where the bar is <laughs> if you've listened to the show. And our job today is to just rise above it. And how hard could that be uh, when we're talking about something that is so central oh, to so many ADHD so many brains? Want this money? Yeah. yeah. Huge, oh, huge factor oh, in, in uh, people's lives, yeah. for sure. Okay, so David, uh, give us, by way of just a brief intro, you're a CFP. Uh, tell us about uh, about your work, what the CFP means for people, so they kind of understand what uh, the kind of work you do, and uh, and uh, how'd you become a, a, a real numbers head? Um, sure, numbers head, yeah, that's funny, because I was really bad at math in high school, uh, but I figured it out <laughs> eventually, but um, I was always interested in finance, um, like stock picking and all that stuff. My dad's a financial planner, but he's much more in the old school, like stock picking thing. And then he hired me and I didn't really know what I was doing for like five years. And then I realized I, had, I have ADHD. Well, actually I knew already I, I had, I knew already that I had ADHD, but I read some books and was like, oh wow, no one told me about all this stuff. So then I was like, let's do this for people with ADHD. So I went down the financial planning path, which is where the industry should be right now is financial planning, which is different than just investing. And so it got CFP, started doing it for ADHDers, and it's been really a blast. So CFP is Certified Financial Planner. It simply means someone who has a CFP, it means that they've you know spent a year or two studying for a big, long six-hour test that covers topics from investments to estate planning to tax planning to insurance to uh, just general you know, cash flow and all like the whole every corner of financial life and even the psychology of financial planning is the newest thing that they've uh, introduced into their curriculum. So it's it's the gold standard for financial planners. And so I have it. So I at least rise above that bar. But um, <laughs> yeah, so you got that what, going that's, for that's, you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Which is nice. Uh, okay, so transitioning to the ADHD brain and money, this is the thing that I'm. That we were talking before the show, and I, I told you I, I've struggled with money. I feel like all my life because of its, uh, the the sort of out of sight, out of mind, uh, and look what's in sight is credit card debt. And so it took me. I've been through the ringer with credit card debt twice. Uh, I'm 50 now. Yes, you are. And, Welcome to the club. Uh, and I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I feel like I have it under control now, and but not without a lot of a lifetime of just struggle and hand wringing. And so I want to know what I've been missing. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where, like, what? What is it that uh, that the how is it that the ADHD brain should be relating to money in a way that might help us be better tuned so that my life can only serve as a warning for others. Yes. The earlier that you come to understand the importance of what money is going to do for you over the long haul of your life and understand it to a point where you're feeling it deeply so that it so that it overpowers the everyday things that we go through with the impulsive spending, the retail therapy. Um, and this is that is by far the biggest issue that I see with people that come to me is, is the spending. They just, they just have no, no clue of where their money is going. They, they've been making more money, more money, but they just keep spending it, keep spending it, keep spending it, and they just don't know how to get control of it. And so coming to the understanding of why, like, wh why should I even bother with getting my money right? I'm, I'm buying things I like. I feel bad about it. Why do I feel bad about it? It's just there's so many questions that need to be answered so you can get grounded in a place where it's like, well, the reason why I'm going to put more time and effort into this is because I want to build a family and have kids. That I want to protect them. I want to have security. I don't want to have stress every day of my life. And this, this is more important than going on Amazon and getting a dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting because I think about like the holidays, right, that are coming up and it's an expensive time, you know, if you're, if you're buying gifts for people and it's so easy 
to get the credit card out and just think, okay, well, I don't have the money. I don't have all the extra money available to buy all of these gifts. So the natural tendency is to put it on the credit card. And then in January, you get that big credit card bill. And now you have this like guilt, right? And like you said, it's like a dopamine hit to buy the gift. And then there's this like huge guilt when you see the, the bill. And something that came to me when you were talking is what a gift it would be to not be receiving that credit card bill. Like, yeah, yeah. The, the gift for me would be to not have to buy you something outside of my means. A hundred percent. Doing money well is one of the ultimate forms of self-care because money is kind of like, it's kind of like a, a, a thing that treats you back. It's like a human almost. Like if you treat your money like crap, it, it finds a way to treat you like crap. It, it, it brings in lots of areas into your life that are very bad, ranging from just everyday minor stress and worrying about how much money you have and relationship little arguments to the worst case, you get laid off, can't find a job and you have no savings at all. So you, you know, really bad things start happening in your life. And so the better, the better you treat money, understand that like money, you have money because you earned it. Like you worked hard for it. It is important that you treat it with the the due respect. So like, keep it like keep more of your money just mm-hmm. keep it it mm-hmm. it protects you if you keep it it saves you from a lot of pain and so you just need to realize that you got to take just like they always say you know take care of yourself first take care of yourself first before you go spending lots of gifts cuz another big thing that i find you know i've had hundreds of conversations this year with people and impulsive spending and excessive generosity is a a big thing that I, I find. And a lot of times it's this, yeah. it's this feeling of a lot of times when we dig down deeper, it's, it's kind of a thing where it's like, I trust you more with this money than I trust myself with it. So I should just give it away. I, I haven't looked at it with the, with regard to the trust piece, but when you said uh, excessive generosity, um, I, I feel like for me, that is, I am not good at so many things for you, per unnamed person, but I know I can do this. Like I can buy a gift in a way to absolve me of any other shortcomings that I may have in our relationship. And that is, you know, if I, I miss deadlines, miss meetings, late from dinner, whatever it is, at least I can pull out the credit card and make it right in my head by way of, of excessive generosity and gift giving. And I, I wonder how much is it, like, is that a trait that you've seen described elsewhere or am I a lonely island? Yes, I think because I think, you know, just think of the times when you when you know you shouldn't be buying something, but you are anyways. Like there's always that in deep in your stomach, you know that this is not what I should be doing, but it's solving this issue now that gives yeah. me that temporary relief that buys me an extra few days. But, you know, like deep down, there's like this thing building like this looming like when will i get this done when will i figure this out why and so i think it always comes for me it always comes down to just the fact that thinking long thinking beyond just a week is hard and and you have to really paint the picture of whatever motivates you if 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 rewards motivate you paint the picture of in vivid detail of what life will be like when you have it straightened out and if if fear motivates you, then paint in vivid detail the pain you would go through if the worst case thing started happening. So mm-hmm. a lot of times it's just that trade-off. It's it's is it better to protect myself long term or to solve this immediate problem? And with the gift giving, you know, it's it's a big one. It almost feels like one. what you're talking about, Pete, is sort of like I I feel like that's just a band aid over something that's so much deeper. Yeah, and I mean. What I what I go to, and this is probably a strange thing to have to talk about, but when um, someone has an affair and then the other partner who didn't have the affair or who had the affair is like, oh, I'm so, so, so sorry. I'm going to give you this beautiful 
new ring or like, let me buy, let's, let's, you know, forgive me and let's buy the house that we've always wanted. I know that's a weird place to go, but it almost feels like, <laughs> wondering how that came yeah, about. but it kind of feels like that. Like, oh, I can buy you this so that you forgive yeah. me or that you accept me. And it's just, it, there's such a bigger issue behind that, that it, it doesn't, when you sit back and look at it, it doesn't make sense, you know? Yeah. I, I want to get to, because all of this, I think, ties directly into how we manage the way we think about money going into the holiday season. But but I know that you have put together, in, in terms of the work that you do with your clients, a way to think about money that is that works for ADHD folks in terms of building a budget, th that price. Can you just walk us briefly through that process before we get into some of the more seasonal aspects of it? Yeah, sure. Um, For sure. So... There is one way of budgeting that I that I like above and beyond any other technique or strategy that's out there, and it's simply called reverse budgeting. Which which is all that means is that when money comes into you, you have predefined goals and you put money towards those goals first, and then the money that's left over is used for life. And you know that since you've mm -hmm. already put so let's say you have ten thousand dollars of credit card debt. You're saying every paycheck I get, I'm going to automatically put $200 extra to the debt. And then the rest of it is here for me to spend. And then beyond that, what I like to do is have at least, well, my system has at least three accounts. So there's an account that's dedicated just for money to flow into that's for the goal. It could be for investing or for paying off debt or for building an emergency fund, whatever it is. That's what that accounts for. There's another account that's always funding your fixed expenses and commitments. So anything that's fixed at all, you add up your monthly fixed expenses and that amount of money gets automatically put into that account and the rest of it goes into a spending account, which is your account for spending money that, and nothing is linked to that account. It's just you handing the card to people to spend. So it's your job mm -hmm. is to keep that account above zero. And if you can keep that account above zero, you know very tangibly, because that's the only account you should really be checking because you know everything else is taken care of, you know very tangibly that you're on track. And so when I have had clients that have been successfully getting there, and it's always a transition mode when they've been on the credit cards forever, you know, it's very hard to fully get to that point. But once they do, what they tell me is, wow, I've never felt such control. I feel like I finally have it together. I feel like I'm actually on track. I'm, I'm making progress. And it's, it's always a reminder when they see their checking account that's for spending, it's above zero. They're like, yeah, I have... I'm good. So it's I just want to execute. have you repeat. So w there's three accounts, yeah. right? So the first one I missed. What was the first one? A goal account. So for instance, a goal account. Okay. So for instance, like if you have the the credit card debt, you would you would open an account, just a checking account, and you would money would get in there. You I, and ideally you'd put money in there automatically. Right. So if you have a direct mm -hmm. deposit from work, you can split your direct deposit to go to various places. So you'd put the money. In there, and, and then and then your bank should allow you to nickname it, yeah. So that helps make it more real. So you can say like, I have one client. My favorite one is she calls it the FU debt fund. <laughs> um, Love that. So the money, <laughs> so the money, so the money goes in there, and then she just has an automatic pool from that account to the whatever credit card she's currently tackling. Um, and then the next account is for fixed expenses, and this is anything fixed at all. So this is rent. This is your mortgage, mortgage your yeah. mortgage, yeah. but it's also things as small as like Spotify and that stuff. So anything that's recurring okay. and you have to get, and, it's, and this is it's painful for some people, but you want to get off using the credit cards to pay for those things because you want to start paying for things with money you actually right. have. So, so you, so you trans, so you move all of those kinds of fixed recurring expenses to that. And then, you can quantify how much that is every month. And then that way you can say, okay, it's $3,000. And if you get paid uh, twice a month, you would have um, $1,500 from each paycheck get automatically dumped in there. Mm -hmm. So you're always funded for your fixed expenses. So where, does, the rest, the, where yeah. does like groceries and gas, like are those fixed expenses? Because they can vary in how they happen every month, but they can vary on how much they are. For this, for the purposes of this, they would be not fixed. Okay. They would be... They would go into the spending account. So anytime that you're you're typing in a credit card number for a new thing, or you're handing your card over to the grocery mm -hmm. uh, store person, um, because because that spending that's in is is directly in your control. Got it. You, there's no prior commit. There's no prior commitment to to grocery shop at Whole Foods. 
you could go grocery shop at the discount. Yeah. So you get, so, so then it's kind of a game then like how do because how do I keep this account above zero? Because if you keep it above zero, you know, like without a shadow of a doubt, you're spending within your means because it's simply using money that you have. Yeah. If you cannot, if you absolutely cannot do it, you have to find where where's where's your problem area. So that you makes know, are, sense are, are because you, you're saying in the spending account, like going out to dinner. And then you have control if you're going to a fast food restaurant or you're going to like the nicest Italian restaurant in town, right? I mean, it's going to be a difference in, in cost. And then the groceries, you are you have control over too if you're going to be eating in or eating out. Like, I see what you're saying. So I'm kind of processing this out loud for it's, our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> but I get, I get so what you're saying. It reminds me of like in the, like my parents, when they, when I was very, very young, they were big envelope budgeters, right? They were cash only. And that's where they knew that utilities, there was an envelope that said utilities and they put cash for utility payment in that envelope. And so they knew that if the, all the envelopes were full, they were set and whatever was left over, they could apportion to goals or, you know, whatever else can, uh, living expenses, uh, like dining out, that kind of stuff stuff that it sounds kind of similar this is a little bit of a throwback it's it is very similar to that for sure for sure um there's just not as many envelopes um because mm -hmm. i mean you like you could honestly you could like you can open as many checking accounts as you want and break it down as much as mm -hmm. you want but for, sure. but that gets overwhelming and it gets it gets it gets stressful and it gets harder to maintain and the whole point of all of this is make it easy to maintain automatic and just be, and then just because I feel like, you know, ADHDers a lot of times we're good at think we're good at be adapting on our feet, right? Like you, it, you're five days away from your your next paycheck, and you're you've already brought your spending account down to zero. Okay, mm -hmm. you kind of you'll intuitively know where you, where you went wrong. It would you will intuitively know like yeah, we went out to dinner a lot this mm -hmm. month. Let's just not do that next month and try that. So you're just kind of adapting mm -hmm. and and going with the flow. You're not going to get there every month. Um, sometimes you'll have to use a credit card, you know. But it's just a way where the plan is always working and flowing. And then your job, you just have one job. It's to keep that above zero. And if you can't, maybe you're not. One thing that I have to tell a lot of people, which is the, my, my least favorite thing to do, but it's you're not making enough money. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the hardest thing to have to tell people uh, when they come to me. I'm like, you're actually doing a great job. Like You're, you're very frugal. But on that income for, for, two, for two people and a kid, it's, I'm like, it's, it's hard. So like, we need to find a way to help you bring more. more income. So I was going to yeah. ask you, yeah. and you sort of brought this up a little bit. Um, when is it a good time to use a credit card? Or do you say don't use, like, what's your philosophy on that with credit cards in general? So, yeah. So yes, people always bring up like it's more secure because you can, and that's true. So there are times when you want to use a credit card, like when you're sometimes when traveling, mm -hmm. like hotels, like they don't want you to use debit cards. Um, when there's risk of there, if there's risk where you think there might need to be a dispute, I would use a credit mm -hmm. card. Sometimes like you're doing a big, big purchase. Um, just you might want to use a credit card because it's big, but like for things like going to the grocery store and stuff and things that like, you know, like you've never had to dispute like your grocery right. store, you know, you know, things you never have to dispute and things like that. Everyday stuff. I like to use the debit card because, um, because the studies show that if you people that use credit cards spend eighty percent more, yeah, I mean, so I can see that. So right. that that eighty percent more over five years is going to be is going to be way more than the few disputes or the few times you had to lose money because of whatever mm -hmm. happened. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is um, I I think it's interesting uh, for a number of reasons. This is why, first of all, I you know I I sort of regret moving to the card kind of society that we're in. And I'm a massive, massive digital payment person. Like I pay with my phone everywhere. It's my always my first thing. And yet I recognize that it makes my work of internalizing my spending harder because I don't have the green stuff in my hands. Like I knew I was out of money when I was out of money, right? Like I, when I had my wallet full of cash, when I was 
like I was out, I was out, I couldn't spend anymore. And now it's like, even with a debit card, like I can, I could overspend a debit, debit card if I wanted to, like, you know, just the way transactions work and timing and things like that. I could limits and, and, you know, backup accounts. Like I, I could, if I wanted to get myself in trouble. And I, I sort of miss as an old guy having actual cash. The, the other piece is I think making it, having that sort of uh, the the safety and security piece. Um, I'm also had my identity stolen and had my uh, credit cards, you know, taken advantage of. And I can tell you, like, both having my credit card account stolen and having my debit card account stolen, uh, I would very much prefer having the credit card account stolen because it is an absolute breeze resolving disputes there. And it's very, very difficult with a debit card. If somebody actually is able to spend on my debit card, like I can't, it's so hard to recover that from that purchase. But a credit card is like lightning fast. And and I've had the banks tell me, please don't use your debit card for online purchases. If you're purchasing something from any online retailer, please just use a credit card and pay it off every month. Um, it, because it's just too hard on you as a consumer to go through having those accounts mm. stolen. So we've we've gone through that process of of removing all of our debit cards from any online payment profile um, just because we've been through that particular ringer. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. So it's a it's it is a double edged sword. Um, yeah, for sure. I would I, I would lean towards if it's a very trusted online vendor. And I still would lean towards using the debit card, but I do see what you're saying, and that's it's a good point. So the way to the way to to use the same system with the credit card is is to every month if you have a zero like a card that has a zero balance, then you know that at, at the end of the month you want that balance to be less than what's in your spending account, so you can use all of that spending account to pay it to zero. So you have to kind of just trick right. your mind to say this is actually this is actually cash. Um, mm -hmm. I'm spending because it because it's just the opposite. You're watching it build to that number. Once you hit the number in the spending account, that's your news like zero. And so, if you can't pay it all off of the spending account, you you've just built debt for that month. I, you've I just gone into think more that's debt. key. Yeah, yeah. Is you really have to change yeah. the yeah. mindset of of this is not a yeah. credit card; it's a debit card that you're paying off. Yeah. At, you know, at the end of the month, because yeah, because then you yeah. could really that's how people get into credit card debt. You know, it's so easy. Yeah. To do yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. and and you could also just try, you know, it doesn't have to be permanent. You can tr like sometimes just going three or four months not using a credit card alone gives your brain time to like heal from like all the, ma habitual all the spending, ma like right. manic spending and like all those patterns. Like if you just stop for three months, like you'll look back and you might realize you might be like, why aren't I having that urge right now to like go on Amazon? That's eerie. <laughs> but like it's good. Like because you just kind of you have to give yourself a break mm -hmm. from it. It's, just, it's like mm -hmm. a, it's like this circus that just this uh, cycle that just keeps going and going and going. So mm -hmm. you really just got to get off the Ferris wheel, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, and doing that functionally gives you a raise, right? Like that's the thing that I have to I I have to keep telling myself is if I stop spending habitually and too easily. I'm essentially giving myself a raise. Like I keep more money totally. in the bank. That's that's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. So like if you're struggling with getting the essentials, you know, transportation, housing, clothes, food, uh, maybe, you know, for me, I just have to stop buying command strips and I can give myself a healthy raise uh, every mm -hmm. every month. Yeah, God, it's, it's so true. And money, oh, and money and money that stays in the bank buys things like freedom, security, yeah. peace of mind. Oh, for sure. And that can it's hard to put a value on. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your stance on uh, on credit cards, uh, like functional use of credit cards with uh, with like rewards, rewards cards? I know that there is a there's such a massive culture uh, of, you know, points, you know, airline points, et cetera, all those points. I have read in the past that those are of some dubious uh uh, uh, sort of function in the overall economy, that they may be bad for the economy, certainly bad for prices, and that you may not be doing anybody any favors by getting a points card. Uh, what do you have a position on those cards? Not on the do the how it's hurting the economy. That's I haven't heard that. So that's interesting. But you have to be responsible with your credit cards. First, period, no matter yeah. what, like if 
your points mean nothing if you're carrying a ten thousand dollar balance. You know, right. they, they right. don't give you back nearly anything close to what you're paying in interest. So you either can responsibly use credit cards or you cannot. If you can, get points. However, you want to get points. You know, you mm-hmm. you want to make sure if you like to travel, use the travel one. If you like to have extra cash so you can buy yourself something on Amazon that's costing you nothing because you're using points, get like an Amazon card, you know? So, mm-hmm. but I'm not really huge into like that because as you can imagine, so much of what I do is helping people stop. Right, so, yeah. It's not, stop. It, so day, right, right, right. day to day, I'm not like helping people find the perfect credit card. I'm saying like, let's just like cut yeah. your credit card off yeah. and throw it away for, for like a few Yeah, months. because I that's think all, it's yeah. a that's little deceiving because it, it is the interest rate and all of what you're paying. It just does it really... Do you really win at the end? I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. If you really, if you really want to, like, get angry, like, add up all of the money you're paying <laughs> yeah. to the to the banks. Like, if you have twenty thousand dollars credit card debt, you know, and it's twenty five percent interest, like, it's a lot of it money. Is. You know that you're that you're paying to to bank to bankers, like to to the bank. It could like, have bought you three things that, that you would be share. getting on Amazon with the points. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah, like, it's yeah. a lot of it's a lot of money, and it's and, and that should frustrate you, and that can be motivating just to see just to see yeah. that because it's like, oh wow. Yeah, I I did. I found the article. I'll post it in the show notes. Uh, the ugly truth behind your fancy rewards credit cards. America's poor foot much of the bill for credit card points, miles and cash back. Uh, it, it's worth reading. Um, it, mm-hmm. And I, I think it's, you know, if you are a, a points person, it's it's Pro- worth just acknowledging is, is, the is, role. Is it because like they are uh, the, the poor, the poor, the poor people can't have the card that has the points, So they have like a higher interest rate, maybe or an average thing like yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Like that. That's that the would, idea. That would make sense. Um, so let's transition now to ADHD, impulsivity, and the holidays. How do you, uh, how do you, you put the brakes on the way you're thinking about, you know, gift giving for people to holidays? How are you guiding your clients right now? My clients are different animals just because they have, they have a structure with me that, you know, they, mm-hmm. they kind of have their roles in place, their, their structure, their, their guidelines, like in their, in their, so they're very cognizant. So th- it's a hard to answer this question in a way that's like, it's November 30th. What are you going to do? Yeah. Right. Um, the real the real answer is to, you know, to, you know, to, to do the work to develop a system so that for like next year, for instance, you're, you're good to go. Like where maybe you you're putting, you know, 10, you know, 20 bucks per paycheck into a into a slush fund account. That's like for Christmas, you mm-hmm. know, something like that. So you're building mm-hmm. up cash for Christmas so that you're not like, oh, I'm going to put, you know, a thousand dollars on my credit card, and now I'm gonna carry that balance for much longer than I'm telling myself because I'm rationalizing that I'll pay it off next month, but I won't. And then it just the thing happens. And then so, frankly, if 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 it, if that's you and that causes stress, ultimately, then the simple answer is just set a limit and and just tell someone that you're setting a limit. Tell someone you trust, an accountability partner, anybody and say, I'm not going to spend over this. If, you know, it's hard. It's so hard though, right? Because like, if maybe you're in a family where everyone's always buying each other like really nice expensive gifts and then you're the one person mm-hmm. that gets the cheaper gift, like, so, so you can just tell your family, like, I'm working on myself. I'm working on my money. So I'm, this is why you're getting this. But like, look forward to like five years. You're going to get amazing gifts when I have right. everything set up. So like, um, so you have to just set a limit and look through and do a cash flow exercise, you know, look, look at your spending for the last three months and see how much money are you actually, you know, have left over and then just set a, set a limit and mm-hmm. spread it out. Be thoughtful with your spending, be intentional, look for deals, go to, you know, the, the outlets, go to the, the discount places, find, you know, and, and be more creative with your gift yeah. giving, make something it's kind of hard to give like, good advice on that, I feel like, but. Well, especially now, like we're, we're talking about this, right? We're recording this the last day of November. And if you like, it's, it's hard to say to those listening, we recognize how hard it is to say, okay, now spread it out over the course of a year because we're living with ADHD and we know that impulse buying is a problem. And most of us haven't started shopping anyway. So (laughs) like we're, we're going to reap the, the, the real sort of, uh, the, 
<laughs> the worst parts of everything. We have it saved, but we're also taking advantage of no sales. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're shopping like yeah. the night before. Right. So, yeah, like we, we, I really recognize how hard it is. Just, just. Yeah, so yeah. And I there. think that the, the lesson too is how do you prepare for next year? So, you know, doing, uh, saving a little bit. I, I remember when I worked at a credit union, they had a special Christmas fund account that you could put money in, you know, every month. And and then at Christmas time, this is what your budget was. It was already there. Um, But something I want to just tack on to to what uh, David was saying. Last night, we had a coaching group and this subject came up about gift giving and ideas and stuff like that. And I think it is about being creative and not having to spend a lot of money um, with, you know, being creative. And some of the things that came up in the in the coaching call were great. Like, um somebody was talking about doing like a theme like basket somebody that you know if you know that they like tea you could do like a coffee cup with some tea and you know make something that's not very expensive but very thoughtful um one of the gifts that i got from somebody it was a picture of us together and they framed it and gave me as a gift mm-hmm. the frame probably did not cost that much money but the thought of having this framed you know picture of of my this person and I was really thoughtful. So I think it's it's doing things that don't have to cost a lot of money because if you're in that family that is expecting you to spend a lot of money and you don't have that money, that's an icky family. Like I'm yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. like that's just not a good like you have more problems <laughs> than just gift buying. <laughs> so Step one, dissociate from your family. Okay. Now let's talk about a budget. (laughs) But I think it is more like what you were saying, Pete, at the very beginning. It's like, where are your expectations? You're probably putting them too high on yourself. And, you know. I was just thinking about that, Nikki. Like you talk about like just framing a simple picture. It is an it is an effort of love. But where my brain goes is I wonder if I could take this picture that I snapped and took me 30 seconds on my iPhone and send it to some uh, artist on Etsy and yeah. have them create like a 16 by 20 oil painting of this picture and bing, bang, boom, $2,000 later, I've got a classic (laughs) fresco. Yeah, right? Like, my God, like that's just ice thin so quickly. You can go to Home Goods, get a frame for like $9.99, you're Uh, good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I think it's being creative. But but to be fair, that's not, that is, that is not as as exciting. Right. It's not as stimulating. That's not as... And there's and spending a lot of money really t- does do something to our brains in the short yeah. term. It, it feels really exciting and the anticipation. Stuff, yeah. But pause, geez, pause, 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 sure. pause, yeah. because I think it is one of those things that, you know, when we've talked about impulse buying in uh, in the past, not just around Christmas, but you know, having that pause button. If you see something, give yourself 24 hours before you buy it, you know, walk away from the store, walk, put it in the cart, but then walk away and, you know, give yourself some time to process it on whether or not it really is something you need and want and, and aren't going to feel guilty about because yeah, that dopamine hit is not worth the, the, the feelings of, of buyer's regret. Yeah. Regret. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's other things you can do, like loss. put a sticker on your on your cards that says, like, you know, like, do you really need this? Like, mm-hmm. is this a, yeah. is this just a one or what are you what are you like? What <laughs> do, what 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 deep sadness to, are that you feel you, you're feeling today? Are you resolving by buying this thing? Like <laughs> something like that, just that, that works for whatever you want and then have something. And but yeah, pausing, saying, asking yourselves, like, is it, am I, is what is this going to be doing for me? In two years from now, mm-hmm. is this providing any value to me beyond uh, beyond this temporary relief or whatever? So I have a more general question yeah. for you because I have a lot of people that I work with individually who will say one of my goals, one of the things I want to work on are my finances. I need to get them in control. They're a mess. I don't, you know, and I don't exactly know what a mess means because it's different for everybody. Um, I'm not the financial person, so I'm not the one like that can really help them with that. Like we can set some goals, but they're going to have to do the research and figure it out. Like, I don't know how to set somebody's budget up. Yeah. Um, that's what you do. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I would refer them to you, but what do you say to people that, you know, yeah, my, my finances are a mess. Don't know where to start. I can't stick to a budget. Like, how do you even like start with someone like, 
when you feel that out of control, you know, in your financial life? Well, that's pretty much everybody who comes yeah. to me. So <laughs> I've, I've got some experience. That's right. um, <laughs> the, the out of control, 9.9 out of 10 times comes down to cash flow, spending more than you make. Um, no one who spends, you know, half of their income and saves the rest will tell you that they feel out of control with their money. Um, so that's always it. So it's just a deep dive into your, into, into you, what you actually want. So what often happens is people with ADHD, cause we, we I always find them to be very nice and good mm-hmm. people. You know, I, you know, generally speaking, very generous. Mm-hmm. They have deep held important values that they want to be living up to, but they they aren't. So it's like their their actions are so divorced from their actual desires that it creates this this chaos and this also the guilt and the shame and the feeling bad. And so identifying deeply what your values are and then ranking like one to 10, like, are you living up? Like, how do you feel you're doing with this value? Um, it's like, okay, three. So maybe the value is... Um, supporting my family and protecting my family. Okay. I feel like I'm doing a three because I have never gotten insurance. Like there's, you know, we're, we're one bad thing away from disaster. Okay. What would it look like if you were a 10? Like, what would it look like? And then from there, it's like, okay, I guess I would have emergency fund. I guess I would have this and that. So then you start framing goals and, but it's all tied to a value that's important to you. And that mm-hmm. helps make it more motivating um, and feel more real and like purposeful. So, that's kind of where you start. But once you figure out those goals and your values and you feel grounded and like, you know, ready, then we dive into cash flow. Mm-hmm. We look at expenses, we categorize, we do an expense worksheet, we see exactly how much you've been spending, exactly how much is left over or not left over. And we say, where are we going to cut? Where are we going to cut? You're going to cut this, that, we're going to do this and that, you know, and then where can you add like income, right? I'm, I'm sure that that comes up mm-hmm. as part of the conversation that's, too. That That's big. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you know, always like, you know, how can you get the next promotion? Mm-hmm. You know, is there something you can do on the side? Um, it seems like you're overqualified for this job. Like, is there, you know, so that's important to you for sure. And then setting up, then we set up the structure, like I'm basically walking them through, like setting up all the accounts and stuff. And then they're kind of on their way. And then they check in with me, like for accountability, see mm-hmm. how it's going, and, you know, where we need to improve. So, mm-hmm. um, that's basically that's basically it but it's it's cash flow yeah. it's it's breaking habits it's breaking habits i think that's really good to just um, hear so that people can see there is a starting point because you know you're looking at everything and you're going off of emotion so i i, I find that really helpful thank you david well and 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 i think focusing on on, on habits like the it's like any other habit like you can treat it like uh, like one of the mini habits mm-hmm. that we've been talking about. Like, did you log your grocery receipts right when you got home? Like, what is it that's going to help you, uh, you know, uh, reprogram yourself to think of money not as this separate giant thing that you have to take on, but as an equal opportunity for change, yeah. just like everywhere mm-hmm. else in yeah. your life. And what's really, and, hu- what's re- yeah, exactly. That's so, that's such a good point. And what's really helpful is to, you get everything organized and everything and we say, okay, we're going to pull cut back on these things and we're going to put this much money towards your credit card debt. And then it's like, that's our first goal. We're just focusing on this one thing. And if you do this re- repeatedly, you know, I'll use my software and say in one and a half years, you'll be out of it. So mm-hmm. that gives them a, a, an end and, and that gives them like, okay. Yeah. And then once that's done, it's like, what's the next step? Okay. Now that you're out of that, let's build a real emergency fund before we've already built like the, you know, the one month emergency fund just to make sure like we can get through this debt payoff cycle, but then let's build a three, six month emergency fund. That's only going to take a year and a half or whatever it is. So that's our next. So there's yeah. roadmap of like, what's next, what's next, what's next. It's not like do all this at once. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's constantly like this journey up the hill making progress and, so, yeah. And of course, I might be like, you need to get estate planning, but that'll be like a side thing. You need you need insurance. But that'll be like that. But the focus is always on yeah. what are they doing that's building wealth? Because ultimately, I'm a wealth builder. You mm-hmm. know, That's what I do. I just help people build wealth, keep more of their money, um, wealth for whatever they want. Do you want to leave a legacy or do you want to die with no money? Whatever. It's up to you. But like, let's figure out the plan to do that. That's mm-hmm. great. I um I, I feel like for me it was it was being able to reprogram my ADHD to get the dopamine hit from the management process 
of of the budget, like being able and and my budget is uh, fine grained, right? Because like I I track every individual subscription, I track every everything you're we rare. have. Yeah. You're a rare. You're a rare breed. Has a line item. <laughs> you are. <laughs> but but you know that's because that's my right. hyper focus. Like I get lost for a day in our budget. And because I do that, I happen to live with a partner who is really good at maintenance. And so once I go in and spend 12 straight hours in fine tuning the budget and where everything is, she'll go in and she'll make sure that the receipts are being entered as they go. And they just track perfectly. And and that stuff, like that has made um, a, a really important difference in, in our lives. Being able to say, my ADHD can work for me and I can get just as much of that electric thrill at looking at where we're saving money as where we're spending it is has allowed us over the last, you know, five, six years to actually save it. It's that, huge. That's I'm glad you said that because that's something that I've I try and tell all my clients is we're gonna change the dopamine reaction from the spending to the saving. Mm-hmm. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna become just as addicted you were to spending as you are to watching your net worth increase mm-hmm. because yeah. that's satisfying. Yeah. So let's get, it takes a while. And a lot of times there was also lots of other work on the back end with like, how did you grow up with money? Yes. Um, what sure. did you see? Lots of times people that, that grew up with a little bit of money, once they finally get money, they think they're just supposed to spend right. it, you know, but you're not. So like you have to teach them how to, what like, so I use some like psychological assessments to that you know, score people and got predictive power, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But it's like, this is what, these are the six characteristics that wealthy people all share. Mm-hmm. And this is your scores on those characteristics. Where can we improve? Where can mm-hmm. we help you with your mindset, with like embracing frugality? Um, I nothing. I love nothing more than seeing, you know, a really nice Tesla in the Aldi, you know, shopping center, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, that person is buying the, the Tesla because he really does value having a nice car, but he also likes to get a great deal on groceries. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it's yeah. interesting. I'm glad right. you bring up the psychological part of it because especially with relationships, because if you look at what breaks relationships, it's a lot of finances, right? Like a lot of times it's around mm-hmm. financial yeah. stuff. Sure. And, um, and it's an important conversation to have when you are in a relationship where you're going to be sharing expenses and paying into, you know, a mortgage or whatever. And, I remember when I first met my husband, he had a bonus from his company and, um, and I was like, wow, that's so awesome that you got this bonus. Like, what are you going to do with it? Like, what are you going to buy for yourself? Right. Cause you just, you work so hard and he looked at me and he's like, well, I'm just going to invest it. I'm not buying anything. Just, awesome. and awesome. I'm like, <laughs> <Yeah>. what? <laughs> but I got to tell you, yeah. we're in a, we're in a very good, positive situation, financial situation because of him, not because of me, but Mm -hmm. I've like, I adapted or I adopted his philosophies of like, you know, saving and not spending just because you have it. And so what I'm, I'm sharing this in the sense that if you are a spender, you can change the shift of how you think, you know? Um, and when you're in a partnership, it's really important that you compromise. And now I'm not saying that he doesn't, you know, we still buy things and we still get things that we want, but, uh, that background is really important to understand where he came from on feeling that way because his parents are the same way and where I did not have that model necessarily. So, well, you know what? That's interesting, Nikki, that that really that case example defines for us. And I think it's important for people to hear it, especially if you're in our community and you are living with ADHD and you have money problems. Those are two separate scales, two separate spectrum disorders. There are many people out there who have an unhealthy mindset about money who don't live with yes. ADHD. Your ADHD is not causing no, your not money struggle. I don't think. I mean, it may right? with the and, impulsivity, and, but I think you're right on. I mean, yeah. This is a this is an issue for humans, right? I mean, this is yes. this is a human, human issue. issue. It's yeah. an issue for yeah. I think that's really important because you can separate those two things and you can use your ADHD as a tool to help, you know, mitigate some of those things. If you then it's not I mean, it's a it's a hard, Mm -hmm. high mountain to climb and you need support, but it's possible to do it and and to live healthily with ADHD and money at the same time. Yeah, yeah, definitely not just an ADHD Mm -mm. thing. Yeah, not. No, it's. 
it's pervasive. I mean, and, and our society is not helped with the consumerism and all that, no. but mm-hmm. where yep. we are. Can we, uh, speaking of consumerism, one last question, and I, I feel like this is a uh, warning there be monsters here kind of question as we wrap up. Because it's the holiday season, uh, many, many places are offering these new buy now, pay later, or pay over installments. Uh, it feels like an old layaway program. Um, and the holidays are a great time for them to uh, be, for retailers to be offering these kinds of programs. Can you just give a sense of uh, what you think of these programs and why ADHD impulsivity should maybe t- take a step back? It's debt. So you just have to remember that you're you're buying now and you're going to spread it over whatever, but you're taking on a liability. You're still paying the same amount. It's going to, cr- it's going to hurt your cash flow in future months because you're paying this every month now. You can't, you can't buy, you can't buy more things because you're doing that. Mm. You can't. You it's can't, not giving you, you permission to buy more that you than you can. Yeah, afford. you can't yeah. increase your spending limit for Christmas because you're actually only spending forty dollars because you're going to spend forty bucks for the next you know six months. You have to treat it the whole thing because you are paying that whole thing. So you just it's it's I have man I've had so many people that you know they just have like dozens of these things and it's like yeah it it they build up and they add up and they're dangerous and it's and I just. I'm not a big fan. It's it's only good for the person that is really good with their money. It really is because they understand the time value of money and they understand that um, having more of their money in their pocket now is worth more than giving it all away now because they could like invest the difference, for instance. And, you know, there's ways to like do the arbitrage, blah, blah, blah. But for not for the people that are living in this if, chaotic yeah. world. <laughs> well, if the only thing you're doing by keeping that money in your pocket is spending it on something else, yeah. that's a problem. Like exactly recently, right. exactly I watched right. I, I watched reruns of The Middle. I love that show. And uh, they had a whole segment on this TV that they bought. And it was like, yeah, you know, you buy this now and you pay later. And they forgot, right? And so now they, they have this bill of like so much money that they have to pay for this TV that they forgot that they were going to pay later. And I think that that's a real issue. Like I can totally see that happening in somebody's ADHD mind. I won't, you know, I'm going to do it later. I'll remember it. I'll get to it. And then all of a sudden two years or a year comes by, you don't remember it. And bam, you've got this big, huge bill that you weren't even yeah, expecting yeah. to have. So, and that's, and then, then next thing you know, you have like 10 collections accounts yeah, and yeah. they're calling and it's, just, yeah. yeah. Those are accounts yeah. you don't no, want to have a lot no. of. It's really, I think yeah. that important lesson. Um, I, I just think it's important to say the words like yeah. it's debt because there are so many companies that are vying for this market as if it's a new thing. It's not a new thing. It is. A, it's a shell game. It's and debt. I, I, yeah. It's debt. It is yeah. just debt. So, um, yes, there's one thing I Thank did want to wow. say from a personal level. I so like part of why this all was important to me is because before I did this and while I was actually in the, you know, being a financial advisor, uh, I'm saying that separate from financial planner because I was more just on the investment side. I was struggling with my money a lot. I, I, I would impulsively spend, and I was building up credit card debt, and I developed lots of shame and guilt about it. And so I had to, I had to work my way through that um, to lead me to the point where I am now, which is still not perfect, but a lot better. And what I did, and which I try and get all my clients to do, but it's, it's the hardest thing to do. But it's, in my opinion, because I think it completely got me off the impulsive spending cycle is to handwrite track your spending every single day. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing what it does to your brain because, and what I did was I had a piece of paper on my counter and I didn't, I wasn't perfect. So I would just come home from work and I would just think about what I bought that day and I just jot it down, you know, you know, and then a week goes by and the paper's filled to the end. And it's like, wow. And then you start doing the mental math. 300 bucks at the convenience store this week. That's ridiculous. And then you just start, you do that. Writing it down is a lot different than mm-hmm. typing it. It's just something with your brain. Um, and it was just the best exercise I've ever done for myself. And so I recommend that. Yeah, good. I think that's huge. And it gets to, I mean, you you look at the at what's going on right now with inflation. Everything is expensive at the grocery store. Everything is expensive. Handwriting it allows you, I think, 
to be much more sort of agile in your spending and roll with with taking money from one category to put it in groceries if you need to, but know that you're going to have a shortcoming. But you have the list every day. You're internalizing it. I think well, that's Well, and really you know, powerful. something yeah. with that too is I, I was at the grocery store. This was a, a few weeks ago, but I had had grapes and she looked at him and she's like, okay, this is from the, the clerk. She's like, okay, so these are like it was like sixteen ninety nine for these grapes. And she kind of looks at me uh. like, are these the right ones? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah. yeah, no, because half of those grapes are going to go bad because we're not <laughs> eating them. I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. I don't want yeah. the grapes, but it's so important to pay attention to that. Like I wouldn't have noticed until she said yeah. something and they were some specialty grape. But um, anyway, probably tasted like watermelon. Yeah. So when you when you do it on the piece of paper, like on your counter, you always see it when mm-hmm. you walk by. And so you are visually seeing every day how the little things are yeah, adding up. Yeah, for sure. And that's kind of what that's kind of because with the with apps and stuff, you have to remember to log yeah. into the app and just it just doesn't hit the same. You know, when you have it on a piece of paper, it's like very in your face and you have to keep it external. So you see it on your yeah. fridge, wherever, put it somewhere. You're always going to see it and remember to do it. But yeah, that's um, a great idea. I love that. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah. This was so helpful. I, I yeah, love it. Huge. David, this is great. You, um, uh, you we, we need to get to the plug part. Uh, obviously, tell us where to find you and tell us just briefly about mm-hmm. your podcast. Uh, yeah, so I have a podcast called ADHD Money Talk. You can find it at ADHDMoneyTalk.com. Um, I've been doing it for almost a year now. I Most of them are just solo episodes of me talking about a topic and whatever, and it's been fun. It's, it's, <laughs> it's getting harder to fit them in and figuring out how to get them done, but I plan to, I plan to keep going and making it so um a lot of people have you know found me and you know become my clients from listening to that just because they need your help just, they yeah. Like it. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. um and if you want to explore like my services you can go to dewittcm.com slash adhd mm-hmm. um that's like the home page for the adhd half of the business because it's you know long story so anyways um yeah that's basically it um Great. yeah um, this was really nice i've really enjoyed being on here uh Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we sure appreciate it, David. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. And thank you, everyone, for downloading and listening to the show. Thank you for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to the conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel and our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level or better. On behalf of David DeWitt and Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. (music) 